This is the third part of a three part series. You might want to watch the other two parts before watching this video. But just to recap, earlier we saw that Lisette Schaefer, a 90 year old woman, was murdered in San Remo in 2001, leaving around 10 million euros in cash and assets in various countries. We saw that her brother, Oswald Schaefer, who was two years older than she was, studied to become a lawyer and then got a job with the Reich Security Main Office. His career was propelled by Werner Best, who was second in command of the SD to Reinhard Heydrich. This led him to becoming the head of the Gestapo at Wesermunde Bremerhaven and then Reichensbergen occupied Czechoslovakia, before being sent to the east to mass murder Jews and others in the occupied Soviet Union as the commanding officer of Einsatzkommando 9. From there he returned to be the head of the Gestapo in Munich. At Munich he oversaw the interrogations of the White Rose resistance movement, including those of the Schell siblings, organized the deportation of Jews from Munich, ordered the murder of two recaptured South African POWs who had taken part in the Great Escape, and participated in the murder and beating of Eastern workers who had been arrested by the Gestapo. Just before the liberation of Munich on the 30th of April 1945, he fled. On the 29th of April 1945, Oswald Schaefer was reported to be cycling south towards garmisch partenkirchen He'd committed crimes in the Soviet Union and in Germany, and he would have known that he would have faced the death penalty if caught. His immediate problem was to avoid the British authorities who wanted him for questioning about the murder of two South African Air Force pilots, Flight Lieutenant Rupert Stevens and Flight Lieutenant Johannes Hayes. In May 1944, the British government had learned of the murders after a routine visit to the Sargon prison of war camp by the Swiss authorities as the protecting power. On the 19th of May 1944, Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden announced this to the House of Commons. Shortly after the announcement, the senior British officer of the camp, Group Captain Herbert Massey, was repatriated to the United Kingdom due to ill health. Upon his return, he revealed how the escape had happened, and how he'd been informed of the murders of the recaptured escapees. On the 23rd of June 1944, Eden announced that those responsible would be brought to exemplary justice. After the liberation of Germany, a team was set up to find the criminals. There was a lead in the south of Germany, and a southern investigation team was set up under Flight Lieutenant Courtney. The Americans had set up an internment camp here in Garmisch Partenkirchen. They were holding a former Munich criminal investigator, Anton Gassner. Gassner had fled from Munich and had gone to live with his sister at Bad Reichenau in near Berchtesgaard. He was arrested there in June 1945. He was able to provide some details about the murder of the Allied airmen and reported on what he had heard of Schaefer's escape, which must have happened before he left. He said that the general opinion was that Schaefer was somewhere in the Tyrol and had probably committed suicide there. The British were able to trace and capture three Munich Gestapo officers and confirm that one, Schirmer, had committed suicide. The three, Weil, Geit and Schneider, were arrested, put on trial and found guilty. The case of Weil is particularly draconian. He had been the duty officer on the night that Schaefer had ordered the two South African pilots to be murdered. He was one quarter Jewish and trying to hide it as best he could. He would once been a police officer and had transferred to the Gestapo, whether voluntarily or not I cannot say. However, where better for an underground Jew to hide than in the Gestapo? He knew that the pilots were to be killed but claimed that he thought that they would already been found guilty by a court. He had gone with the prisoners on their final journey. When the car got to the predetermined location for the murder, the pilots were offered a chance to get out and urinate. He took the opportunity to do the same. When they were shot, he was urinating and came back to find that they had been killed. He freely gave evidence to the investigators. It didn't help. Albert Pierpoint hanged him in Hamlin Prison on the 27th of February 1948. That year, the British government announced that it would not continue to seek the murderers of the Great Escape Killers. As it happened, it was the German authorities who found Oswald Schaefer, and not in the Alps, but in Limburg and Lahn, to the east of Koblenz. In his denazification trial, Schaefer was classified as a main culprit. 
This meant that most of his assets were seized and he lost the right to a pension. However, he had friends who remembered him from the old days. Ernst Ackenbach was a politician of the centre-right FDP. During the war, he had been head of the political department of the German embassy in Paris. He was involved in the deportation of Jews from France. After the war, as a lawyer, he defended, amongst others, former Nazi officials who were accused of war crimes. He called for a general amnesty for them. Ackenbach worked with Werner Best once he had returned from imprisonment in Denmark. Former SS Obergruppenführer Best had given Schaefer his first job at the Reich Security Main Office and he was happy to help him now. Best found Schaefer a job as a commercial manager in Hamburg. In March 1950, an investigation and criminal proceedings for aiding and abetting manslaughter were initiated against Schaefer and Richard Lebküchner, the former head of Department 2E, that was the general work deployment of foreign nationals of the Munich Gestapo Control Center. This trial was before the Munich 1 Regional Court. The background was that in November 1942, the RSHA had ruled that as from the beginning of 1943, punishments of foreign workers were to be decided upon locally. This punishment was either what was termed short treatment, which was up to 75 strokes of a whip or cane, or imprisonment, which could be decided upon by the local Gestapo. The other form of punishment was special treatment, that is death. As this was a local decision, superior orders were no defence. The prosecution claimed that at least 20 Eastern workers arrested by the Gestapo for various crimes had been committed and at least 60 had received short treatment. In court, Schaefer argued that after the Nazi seizure of power, the Weimar Constitution no longer applied and therefore he was complied to follow the guidelines given to him, even if he didn't agree with them personally. In any case, he was unaware of any abusive treatment that had occurred at the Gestapo in Munich. The crucial question in the trial was to ask if the order of the RSHA was binding or not. If it was, then a plea of superior orders could be valid. Public prosecutor Neudeck argued that the defendants had chosen to act in a barbaric manner. Indeed, Richard Lebkuchner, who had served at Pretsch where the Einsatzkommandos had been trained, admitted to taking part in executions and beatings, but claimed that he'd never exceeded his orders. Bavaria had introduced the jury system in 1948, which was unique in Germany. To everyone's surprise, the jury found both of the defendants not guilty on the 22nd of March 1950. This led to a wave of public protests and the very next day questions were asked in the state parliament as to how this was possible. The reason given by the Bavarian Justice Minister, Josef Müller, was that it was probably as a result of expecting juries to make decisions on complex legal matters. The president of the Bavarian Landtag, Georg Stang, said that he rejected the verdict in the strongest possible terms and it shakes the belief in the legal system. He added that the most serious violations of human dignity and crimes against humanity had occurred and this verdict only encouraged the return to the former system of brute violence. Bavarian members of Parliament accepted this declaration almost unanimously. Only one member of Parliament, August Hausleiter, argued that there had to be a separation of the legislature and the judiciary. In Parliament, the scene grew so heated that fearing violence, Georg Stein cancelled the session. A telegram was sent to the American High Commissioner John McCloy to overturn the verdict because, as the telegram put it, by acknowledging that these Gestapo bandits were working on higher orders, democracy would be greatly endangered and confidence in the law threatened. The press throughout Germany railed against the verdict. The jury did not understand that this was an illegal order and that no state can legally order murder to be committed. To make it worse, the defendants had not denied that they had carried out these murders. On the 25th of March 1950, the Bavarian Federation of Trade Unions organised a protest rally. The trade unions called for a reform of the judicial system to ensure that this would not happen again. The public prosecutor Neudeck appealed against the verdict, saying that the defence had adopted a strategy to confuse the jury with complicated explanations of legal questions. As far as the jury was concerned, Nine of them had not faced denazification procedures, two were Mitlaufer, that is to say followers, and one had been exonerated. Under Bavarian law, the jury did not have to justify its verdict. 
On the 20th of September 1950, the Bavarian Supreme Court overturned the jury's verdict. On the 29th of May 1951, a jury court now in accordance with the federal law of the 12th of September 1950 and made up of legal professionals convicted both defendants after a four-day session. Schaefer got two years imprisonment and Lebkuchner 30 months. On the charge of murder, they were acquitted again. The prosecution had only requested seven and eight years imprisonment respectively. The judges said that no evidence had been presented to them that showed that the defendants had taken the law into their own hands. They argued that the cases were such that the victims would probably be sentenced to death anyway had their cases gone to a normal court. As Schaefer and Lebkuchner had been detained for the length of the sentences given, they were now released. This time, the public reaction was more muted than it had been in 1950. The prosecution appealed again and achieved an annulment by the Federal Court of Justice in 1954. However, the prosecution saw little chance of a successful new prosecution after the same Federal Court of Justice acquitted Schaefer's predecessor, Frank Marmon, most recently head of the Gestapo in Castle, on a similar charge. Marmon was acquitted due to a lack of evidence that he was aware of the illegality of the orders. In 1965, Schaefer was put on trial again, this time in West Berlin, alongside Karl Rath, Heinz Tangermann, and his successor as commanding officer of Einsatzkommando 9, Wilhelm Bernhard Paul Wiebens. Both Rath and Tangermann had been subordinates of Schaefer and had been involved in killing Jews under his command in Vitebsk and Lipel, amongst other places. Around the end of March or the beginning of April 1942, there was a report that a number of enemy elements were travelling near Vitebsk. It turned out to be a group of Roma. Wiebens immediately put together an execution squad and ordered the entire group of 23 people, men, women and children, to be shot. An older woman had begged him to spare her. Wiebens refused, remarking, it's better to shoot many innocent people than to let one guilty person go. His command also shot the old woman. As the court found, the murders were carried out on Wiebens' own initiative, meaning that superior orders, so often cited by the defence, could not be used. Rat and Tangerman were sentenced to five and six years in prison, respectively, for aiding and abetting murder. However, Schaefer was acquitted. This crime he did not commit as he was then in Munich. Ironically enough, one of the witnesses at this trial was Schaefer's predecessor at Einsatzkommando 9, Albert Filbert. The Jewish Telegraph Agency reported on the 9th of May 1966. Three former officers of one of the Nazi commando units received prison terms in a West Berlin court this weekend, ranging from five years at hard labour to life, for participating in the murder of Jews and gypsies in German-occupied Russia. In announcing the verdicts, the jury foreman criticised the defence witnesses because their evidence was not objective. Wilhelm Wieben, 60, former commander of the unit which was set up to exterminate inferior races, received the life term. Heinz Tangermann, 53, received a term of six years in prison and Karl Rath, 57, was given five years in prison. Oswald Schaefer, 57, was acquitted for lack of evidence. Defence attorneys said that they would appeal the three sentences. The life sentence was imposed on Wiebens because it was proved that he had shot two Jewish workers and had participated in other killings. The Tangerman sentence was considered light because he had been charged with ordering the shooting of 1,100 Jews. The jury held that it had not been proved that he had acted on his own initiative and found him guilty only of being an accessory. The jury foreman said that the acquittal was a verdict for Schaefer because, whilst there was grave suspicion against him, there was not enough evidence to convict. 24 years after the Great Escape murders, Schaefer was put before a German court for the killings of the two prisoners of war from South Africa, Flight Lieutenant Stevens and Hayes of the Royal South African Air Force. He had clearly given the order for the murder of the two men, as was shown in the Hamburg trial. But on the 11th of December 1968, he was once more acquitted. Oswald Schaefer died on the 9th of November 1991 in Hamburg. 
as the attitude of the German government towards Nazi criminals changed after reunification, could he have been tried again? I accept that Martin Sandberger, who had headed an Einsatzkommando in the Baltic states, managed to live unmolested in a retirement home in Stuttgart until 2010. However, I think from a legal point of view, he was in a situation where he'd already been tried once for the crimes he'd committed, he had been sentenced, and he'd served his sentence. Had new crimes come to light, then he could have been tried for them. Schaefer was tried for some of the crimes committed whilst head of the Gestapo and a murder which had taken place after he'd left the occupied Soviet Union. However, he was not tried for the crimes which I've described here that occurred whilst he was head of Einsatzkommando 9. I'm not a lawyer, so my opinion's not worth much in this case, but it would be curious to hear from people who are better qualified in such matters than I am. So let's move forward another 10 years to talk about the wealth that his sister had. Of course, I cannot prove this. I don't know, but I think it's highly likely that it came from her brother. Nazi Germany was a highly corrupt state, although corruption could be punished. Schaefer's predecessor at Einsatzkommando 9 was charged with embezzlement and he was suspended from the RSHA for two years. A rather weak sentence in the circumstances coming from a state that had draconian laws. The SS Straflager Dachau, to which Schaefer had applied to make cells available for his prisoners, could accommodate those who were lucky enough to be accused of corruption. Schaefer had every reason to fear punishment after the war. In the immediate aftermath of liberation, a number of Nazi war criminals were hanged by the Americans, and after that the German authorities did take an interest. If Schaefer had appeared too wealthy, this could have created an interest. Of course, I could be wrong. Maybe Lisette Schaefer had made some very wise investment decisions. Maybe she'd won the racetrack. Or maybe she had a wealthy secret partner. Whatever it was, she died very rich and her brother died very unpunished. It might be of interest to see a little bit about the background of this video. On 6th of March 2023, Trouta Lafrenz died. She was the last surviving member of the White Rose and I put together a video on her life. Over the past 12 years or so, I've published small snippets on the White Rose. My friend Jud Newbaum had written a book on the subject and he regularly speaks about it and uh, through other mutual friends. This is a regular topic of conversation. The video on Trauta Lafrenz led me to reading the Gestapo transcripts of the interrogation of the White Rose members, which then brought me to the videos I did on the Gestapo officer Robert Moore and the caretaker at Munich University, Jakob Schmidt, who detained the two Schirl siblings. In the summer of 2023, I travelled to the Jeben Heath and the former border school at Pretsch, where the Einsatzkommando were trained, and although there's no archive there, I was fortunate enough to speak to a local historian. I had already done videos relating to Baba Yar, which I visited in May 2022. Indeed, in one video from there, the air raid siren is clearly heard in the background. The plan is to continue doing more videos relating to the Einsatzgruppen and the men who were in them. I upload every Friday at 20 hundred hours my time, so that's to say um, time in Poland or Germany where I live. I also sometimes upload on other days as well, and when I get the chance I do live chats. So if this is the sort of thing that interests you, then you might want to subscribe. But for the moment from me, thank you very much for listening.